Hello, this is Rebecca Getz, a staff member of the IPLJ, and today I have the distinct pleasure of speaking with someone who has not only shaped the landscape of fashion, fashion modeling law, but has also stood at the crossroads of advocacy and innovation within the industry. I am joined by Professor Doreen Small, the co-creator of Fordham's Fashion Modeling Law course, a global first, and a former general counsel of Ford Models. With a career that's seen her as a key player in the industry and as an advocate representing both models and agencies, Professor Small's intersection of <clears throat> modeling and law knowledge is unparalleled. Today, we will uncover the layers of modeling law and discuss the fascinating changes shaping this glittering industry, beginning with the industry's evolution and moving towards the future. So let's dive into the world of fashion, modeling, and the law with Professor Small. So first, just to start off, thank you again for making the time to speak with us today. We really appreciate your time. Can you oh, tell- My pleasure. And, and I, just a note of caution, I have a very old sleeping dog who may uh, wake up and start woofing, so. <laughs> That's okay. No worries at all. It sounds great. So aside, aside from your dog, can you tell us more about yourself and why, how you came to the world of fashion and law? Sure. Um, well, it, I, uh, I didn't start out as a lawyer. Um, my first career actually was as an art historian, and um, uh, it was interesting and um, confusing. I was it, it it was at a time when uh, the art world was in a little bit of a turmoil, not that it isn't now, but um, I went, uh, left New York and I'm a native New Yorker. I left New York and I, I moved to Los Angeles and I kind of backed into being a filmmaker. My, uh, my, um, Landlord said, you're artistic. Uh, I need an assistant art director. So I became the assistant to the assistant art director on a movie. And the art director was a lovely guy. He had been uh, to art school in Philadelphia. And he said, I want to introduce you to my friend, David, who's making a film at the American Film Institute. And it was David Lynch. And I met him and I started working on a film called Eraserhead. And um, anyway, I was a filmmaker for about 10 years, uh, moved back to New York after being in LA for about eight years and uh, wound up working at Saturday Night Live, uh, wow. producing the parody commercials for SNL for a season. Um, but it was tough going uh, being a freelance uh, film employee. And uh, one of my sisters who was pregnant at the time said, Sure. Why don't you think about going to law school? And um, you can, you know, take the the LSAT and tell me about it. So I I took the LSAT and I did surprisingly well. And she's because I I was a creative. I you know I majored in art history and fine art and read the sports and the gossip. Didn't know there was a dual court system. Just <laughs> it, it was alien territory for me. Um, so she said, why don't you just apply to law school and you can tell me about the application process. So I applied to law school and, uh, Brooklyn law school was nice enough to accept me. <laughs> uh, I, I went and I, I knew pretty much from the beginning that I was interested in intellectual property. Um, uh, first of all, the cases were short. <laughs> <laughs> They, they, they were mercifully easy to read. I, I understood the subject matter. And I thought I could help creatives um, get to yes. And uh, so as a lawyer, I started out at Big Law. I started out at Wagachal and Manji's. And um, it was um, interesting. It was uh, Big Law is not for everybody. It, it is for some. It, it, it really wasn't for me, although I, I managed to stay there five years. But every day I'd go square peg, round hole, square peg, round hole. It, it just it just wasn't uh, wasn't a great fit. Um, but then I wound up, and I I I always tell my students, it, you know, uh, to keep an open mind about uh, the kinds of jobs they want to do because. I, after Wagacho, I wound up at General Electric and it would not have been 
a place I would have thought I would go to, but it wound up being a, a really lovely job. Um, they were great to me. And, uh, and at that time, GE owned NBC. So I wound up moving to NBC and I became the senior IP lawyer at NBC. Wow. Where I was the lawyer for SNL. <laughs> Uh, having been the creative, I was now the suit, and I, I wound up working uh, for the same film unit I, I was a creative for. I was now telling them what they could not could not do. Um, oh, so wow. I stayed there for five years, and then uh, I had an opportunity to be general counsel at a, 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 a dot .com. Um, it was a very exciting opportunity female-run business, 170 employees, um, very exciting, based in Soho, but it it, it wound up uh, not taking flight. And um, so I, I bounced around a little bit and, and wound up, my first kind of fashion job was at a company called Warnico, um, which is now, uh, uh, was acquired by a company, Philips Van Heusen. And Warnico at that time was the, uh, North American licensee for Speedo. Uh, they were the licensee for Calvin Klein underwear, Calvin Klein jeans. So it was, um, I, I was the associate general counsel and my niche was the all the, I, all the IP stuff, all the licensing endorsements. And it was the first time I actually had seen a, a modeling contract because of you know, all the Calvin Klein underwear ads. Okay. Um, uh, and it was a nice job, nice enough. Um, but uh, a friend of mine uh, said to me that there was an opening for a general counsel at Ford. And I I went up there and I met with them. They were in the process of um, selling the company. Uh, Katie Ford was still there. Um, uh, uh, Jerry and Eileen, who I'll talk about a little bit, had, had retired, but were, were still around. Anyway, I was interviewed by the CEO and he said to me, I, I want a lawyer who asks for uh, forgiveness and not permission. And I said, I'm home. <laughs> yes, that's I've been doing live TV for five years. You know, they want it hot and fast. So um, that's when I, I started uh, working with modeling. And uh, I found that it was an area that was kind of perfect for me because it was interesting. There was enough of it to be interesting and keep me absorbed, but it was circumscribed enough for me to feel like I could be an expert and get my hands around the issues. Um, and from uh, that's where I met my um, future law partner, Allie Marcourt. She was in house at uh, uh, Wilhelmina and she and I co-created the fashion modeling course and Ali's considerably younger than I am and uh, considerably more ambitious than I am uh, and she said Dora why don't we why don't we go out on our own why don't we start our own firm and I you know wow. I said Ali only if you you know you do all the back room um, <laughs> I said okay uh, so we did we started Marquardt and Small and uh, we had the work from Wilhelmina and I had some work from Ford and from some other uh, companies. Um, and uh, it was it was fun. We we set up a shop at Noya House, which is a shared workspace. We were uh, initial adopter adapter adopters at Noya House. We, it hadn't even been finished. The construction wasn't completed when we moved in. But it was it was great, and um, we had one associate who had been working with Ali at at Wilhelmina, and uh, but we found it difficult to scale. Um, we we tried all sorts of things. We briefly merged with a, a, a visa firm because Ali and Ashley, our associate, um, did visa work, and um, that was a disaster. That didn't work at all. And uh, not, not that she wasn't a lovely person, it just wasn't a fit. And, um, and then we, you know, we, we tried taking on other associates and we just, we just couldn't scale it up. And, and then somebody offered to acquire us, a firm based in Los Angeles, um, who wanted to start a fashion practice in, in New York. And um, 
And then Allie, by that time, was married and had one one kid, and she moved to L.A. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was in in New York with Ashley, and uh, I it. it it wasn't a fit for me with at the at the law firm. You can see a pattern. <laughs> it's okay. I always, you like to try new things and jump around. It sounds awesome. Yeah, I, I tell my students I'm I'm the human pinball. You know, uh, <laughs> I am too. Yeah, I there's no linear shot for me. Um, but uh, at least uh, so I I resigned from. Um, it was uh, from Eisner Jaffe, then the Eisner Law Firm. Ali stayed for a year more longer than I did. And she's, she's now um, a senior VP at Universal Music Group. So she's, she's doing super wow. well. She has two kids now. Um, so uh, while I was at Eisner, I, a, a friend of mine from Ford, Mitch Grossback, um, he, he was doing some work with ASAP Rocky and they, they needed some trademark work. And I've been doing trademark work since the wild gotcha all days. So I said, sure, I'll do it. And um, uh, but, uh, Rocky's main firm was a firm, Davis Shapiro, um, an entertainment firm, mostly music. And um, they they really, they liked me. And uh, so uh, when I was unhappy at, at, at Eisner, I started listening to them uh, wooing and courting me. And uh, I, I moved to Davis Shapiro, Lewitt and Grable, and I'm a partner there now. Uh, um, and uh, the only change, I've been there for five years, which tends to be the longest I stay at pretty much anything. Um, but uh, I, I work from home um, uh, since the pandemic. And uh, they they wanted my real estate. They wanted my office because they were expanding. So they they quietly, they, you know, they said, Doreen, would it be okay if you work from home? I said, oh, yeah. Please. <laughs> Twist my arm. <laughs> Uh, it's fine by me. So anyway, that's that's the the the, the saga, the Dorian saga. Um, and uh, and Ali and I created the fashion modeling law course, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago, a uh, long time ago. Uh, I had when I was still at Ford, one of my interns from Brooklyn Law School uh, was taking a course in fashion modeling law and uh, Professor Scafidi was teaching it uh, at Brooklyn. And um, I said, oh, that's very interesting. Um, you know, perhaps the class would be interested in hearing about modeling. So um, uh, the student made the introduction and I spoke in Professor Scafidi's class and I pitched the idea of the course in fashion modeling to her because she was uh, developing the Fashion Law Institute. And uh, uh, she, coincidentally, Allie had pitched the idea to her and, and that, that's how, how we met. And uh, well, actually I had met her at an um, immigration conference before then, but um, we, we planned the course together over uh, serious amounts of sake and sushi. And, <laughs> That's, that's how we, we got the curriculum. And we've tweaked it over time. And then Ashley, when, when Allie moved to LA and uh, uh, couldn't no longer commute, sometimes she'd make guest appearances. Ashley, the woman I told you about, um, she, she, she took over the class. Um, then she and I co-taught for uh, a couple of years. But it's it's uh, I'm not sure we're gonna we're gonna resuscitate it. It's it's gonna it's it needs some tweaking. So I'm not exactly sure we might just let it go. Anyway, that's me. <laughs> that I mean, it all sounds great. It sounds like you had a very untraditional path towards law in your career now, which is super great. I also have an untraditional path to law. I was a STEM student beforehand, so it's great to see that you fell into IP and modeling and you worked at all kinds of places i big law snl in particular is super exciting and very niche not a lot of people have experience in that so it's cool you got to work there twice and now yes. you're pinballing around and you landed up in modeling and you were able to start this course which is super amazing and a great segue to start our talk about the origins of the modeling industry so maybe we can start by if you can walk us through how the modeling industry has evolved over the years, particularly if you want to mention the beauty standards, inclusivity, and diversity. Okay. Um, so uh, modeling's been around uh, for a long, long time. Um, you know, uh, people posing for artists, uh, uh, 
uh, walking in showrooms. Uh, but modeling is a business started with uh, in New York with um, uh, John Conover. Uh, they were basically uh, th there were some modeling schools, but it was pretty shady uh, kind of profession. And um, Katie Ford, who was not Katie, Eileen Ford, who was a, a young wife in, in the 40s and had actually done a little modeling um, on her own new new models and uh, said, you know, I can I can help you. I can I can I can take care of some of the back room stuff for you. So she and her husband, Jerry, started the modern model management business. And they worked out of their home. Uh, they worked the phones. They worked out of their home. They professionalized the the, the business. They they instituted a, a system of vouchers, uh, where uh, a model would basically um, uh, create a chit, a piece of paper, and uh, pop it in in a in a box after the job uh, with the terms and conditions of the job, and um, then. I, Eileen and Jerry would make sure the model would get paid, that they would get paid on behalf of the model and make sure the model got paid. So, uh, and and they they were at the forefront of 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 the industry, um, and it was it was pretty New York centric for a long time. And a fellow named John Casablancas opened Elite in in Miami, in 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 Paris rather. And uh, th there was a lot of synergy, a lot of back and forth. And, and then uh, Casablancas, who had promised not to, uh, opened an agency in New York. And uh, Eileen and Jerry, uh, by then they had a townhouse on, on the east side. And so they, they were very, well, I hope this works, um, very uh, proper. Um, uh, it was a, a, a ladies and gentlemen type of organization. Um, and Casablancas, it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was very, very, very different. And Casablancas poached quite a few models from Ford. Uh, and there was a lot of litigation. Wow. Was it ranging in ages or relatively the same? Like 18-year-olds, any minors? Um, uh, the, the models were, were older then. They tended to, the, the, the young ones didn't start, uh, th that, that era didn't start for a while. Mm. But anyway, so. I'm getting ahead that, of myself. So that's like, that, that morphed the industry a little bit. And um, the other big change, and we'll, we'll start talking, it was, it was globally diversifying. So, so, so things were, were changing. But that 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 was the the start. Um, the in terms of you know you asked a question about diversity. Um, it wasn't. It it was not a very diverse business. Eileen and Jerry famously liked Nordic blondes. Um, that that was the standard. Um, uh, um, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes. Uh, uh, tall, always tall and thin, very long limbs. Um, uh, the weight issues, um, weight issues and age issues, I guess, well, you wanted to segue to those. Um, there are a lot of rules about weight. Um, uh, all in Israel has something called, you know, uh, Photoshop laws, which uh, regulate body mass index and also how models are portrayed in 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 ads. Um, uh, rules in Paris in terms of doctors' visits and measurements. N none of it is is observed. If if you if you look at pictures of models on the runway, they're very 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 thin. Um, and body, body mass index actually doesn't measure health. Um, there are other ways to measure health um, and and. The, the problem with, there was a, 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 a the issues of, of, of age and weight were attached for a while because, uh, especially with female models, the younger they were uh, before their hormones kicked in, before they started taking birth control pills, um, easier, uh, they were in some instances naturally thin. Right. Um, 
and it became more and more difficult for some of them to maintain that weight over time and resorted to drugs and smoking and all sorts of other things to to keep that that thinness um the age issue has morphed over time and and i can take some credit for that um there it there was a um, child models who uh, Models under the age of 18 who worked as adults weren't and um, I worked uh, along with the model alliance and Professor Scafidi and some others and we retained a lobbyist and, and we managed to get the, the laws changed to include uh, child models uh, working as grown-ups uh, in, in the labor laws. So there was much, much more scrutiny uh, for uh, many more hoops and hurdles. Um, the protections meant that uh, had to have a work permit, always had to have a work permit, but nobody ever paid attention to the work permit. The hours were regulated. The, the trust accounts needed to be set up. So it just it pushed the needle. It made it more difficult. And uh, it was a very good thing because when you know, designers did not need to use 16 year olds, they didn't, they didn't. The blush is still on the rose at 18 and 19 <laughs> and 20 and, 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 and older. So um, you don't see now um, hardly any under 18s uh, uh, working as, as grownups. It's, it's, it's too much of a hassle and there's a, a fairly bright light shining on, on, on people who do. So um, that's, that's super nice to see. Professor Scafidi also mentioned that to us as well. And it's definitely nice to see the progression changing from younger models to a now an age of 18 without having to worry about eating disorders and pushing work permits and Etc. So that's eating disorders are still with us. Uh, you know, disordered eating. I, I think uh, smoking is still very, very, very prevalent in mod, uh, modeling. Sometimes I get on the phone with uh, clients who is a model, and I and I hear the inhaling. Oh. And uh, you know, a friend of mine who's a a, a vegan still smokes cigarettes. Uh, um, yeah, I I think there's uh, there's the standard of beauty which has changed over time. Uh, the standard certainly for image modeling is still very thin, very thin. And, and, and I, I would say, by and large, unsustainable for normal humans. Um, but many models are genetic anomalies. I, I, I mean, they, they, they just are. And uh, um, so, yeah, uh, that's, it's been through some some ups and downs, some very positive changes, as I said, in terms of race, inclusive a friend of mine, um, friends of mine uh, um, own um, an agency called Community uh, Creative New York, um, and uh, they represent um, trans models, models with disabilities, um, you, you know, people who uh, who otherwise wouldn't have opportunities at, at more traditional agencies. Um, and they're, they're, they're doing great. They're doing great. Uh, yeah. So even when I was at Ford, th there would be, you know, one black woman in the shoe. There was a lot of to tokenism. And uh, one of the black models who had achieved a certain amount of traction in, in the industry, Beth Ann Hardison, um, started campaigning, campaigning, campaigning for more inclusion, but it took an awful, awful long time, an awfully long time. Um, uh, but but now, now we see there's a lot more diversity in terms of race um, on the runway. Um, not and and in and, and in ads and in campaigns uh, um, uh, and there are different types of of models. Um, there are you know the models you think about when you think about the runways, the major campaigns. Those are called image models. And then there are the models who show up in Eddie Bauer catalogs and 
um, do Pantene hair care and uh, drugstore brands and those are the commercial models. Uh, there are models who who do um, uh, the you know the pamphlet that's in your dentist's office and they're they're direct models. There are used to be called plus models now called curve um, mm. who are a little bit larger in size and there's been much more inclusivity in terms of uh, uh, larger size. Uh, this, the sample size is, is very small. Sample size is the size they build the runway garments on, the zeros and twos. And when you think that most of the models are 5'10 and taller, you know, very, very thin. Um, also, just to backtrack, when you said genetic anomalies, can you elaborate on what that means for those who maybe don't necessarily know the industry as well or the models? That they have genetic gifts. So they win, model, many models have won the genetic lottery. They, they just are. That they, again, tall, long limbs, wide spaced eyes, uh, uh, you know, beautiful proportions. Um, you know, it's not necessarily beauty so much as it is bone structure and, and uh, physical makeup that, that makes a model. But in some ways, models are not just born. They are created in some ways by the agencies and their agents. Um, you, you know, you, you talk about uh, models learning to walk. So to walk a runway is, is an art um, that when I was at Ford, uh, one of the male agents taught the models how to walk. Walk. He he was actually a dancer in 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 a former life. Um, how how to pose? My client Coco Rocha is very is famous. She has a modeling school now and um, teaches uh, mostly. I think she only has young women. Um, how to walk? How to how to move before a camera, how to engage with, with the lens, how to engage with the photographer, how to um, package themselves. And that's what, what good agents do. And uh, one thing I, I also tell the class is that there are good agents and bad agents, there are good agencies and bad agencies, there are good parents and bad parents, and there are good models and bad models. And that that to um, demonize any one aspect of this very human business is, I think, a, a, a mistake because I, I think there is accountability in every corner of, 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 of this industry. Of course, so. I think it goes widely unrecognized and it is a human industry. They are real people, not just models showing up clothing, representing a hanger, for example, as if he mentioned to us earlier so that's it's super nice that you're able to advocate on their behalf and something I want to do in some capacity one day I know you mentioned um, the model management and agencies so now we can transition into the business side of things which I know you wanted to touch on if you can explain the key differences between model agencies in California for example and model management companies in New York and why those distinctions are very important. Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, when Eileen and Jerry started out, um, they were actually agencies. They were licensed under um, uh, New York law. Um, it, under New York law, talent agencies have to cap commission at 10%. And uh, there came uh, a point in time, and and in terms of commission, um, the 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 business model for a model agency, model management company is it, it's a dual revenue stream. So the the agent books a job for a model. Let's say it's it's a thousand dollars for for the job. Typically, commission is twenty percent of that thousand dollars. And in addition, the agency charges the client a 10% service fee for doing what it does to get the model there. 
uh, and ready and the paperwork involved. So out of the $1,000, uh, it'll be, if the, if the agency is nice and reputable, they'll mark it up. It'll say 1000 plus 20%. So it'll be $1,200 total. And out of that $1,200, the model will keep eight and the agency will keep four. Okay. So that's how it works. So anyway, um, they were agencies until the early 70s when um, Jerry uh, felt a little confined uh, by the 10%. Um, and they they lobbied and, and uh, managed to uh, forego uh, their license and um, turn themselves into management companies. Wow. So not agencies, no cap on commission, no licensing requirement. Um, and there is something um, in the general business law. I have my notes in the other room. I think it's section 171 or 178. It's called the incidental booking exception to the general business law, which allows managers to book incidentally book jobs. Oh, wow. So if you look at uh, 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 an agreement, a uh, representation agreement uh, for New York, um, a, a management contract, you'll see all these other things that the management company does for the model. No promise of work, only incidentally books work for models. Oh. Uh, yeah, this, this has been challenged, uh, but it has survived challenge uh, over time. Um, in California, uh, modeling agencies are in fact agencies. They're licensed uh, by the California Labor Commission. Um, they have standardized contracts. Um, there are, uh, they have to be, they have to post a bond. Um, the rules are that uh, they, uh, if a model does not get a job, um, is not offered a job uh, for four consecutive months, uh, if the model is available, ready, willing, and able to accept the work, that the either party can terminate the agreement. Um, and the key is there's no cap on commission in, in Los Angeles. Cool. And managers in California cannot book. There is no incidental booking exception. So you need to be a licensed agent in California to do any booking whatsoever. If a manager books a job and talent is unhappy with that manager, um, the talent can sue the manager and the manager has to disgorge the any commission of the commission. So um, those are, it's it's a it's a the setups are are quite different. There's a much greater incentive to develop models in New York um, because there is there isn't the four month rule. Um, you know, we talked about developing a model, how a model is groomed, taught to walk, taught to pose. That could go on for a while without the model making any money. And so not booking a job for four months or, or more. And to invest and to not have any return is, it's a, it's a little, it's problematic in the California market. So you don't see as much development there as you do in, in, in the New York market. Um, so those are the fundamental differences. The um, most modeling agency, the New York based model management companies have branches outside of, of New York and um, they have, uh, they use the New York, New York contract and it's, it's called um, a network agreement. And it's only if they sign, if they have a branch in California and they're signing a model just to work in the California market, that's when they use the California only contract. Um, oh, so it's mar it's place specific, New York versus California, where the model's working. Yes. Can they do both, or is it just one or the other? Yeah. So if 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 I'm signed, if I'm signed to you know um, one my my client who I just hung up on, uh, <laughs> uh, I um, 
I, I will, and I want to work in all the markets they expect. I'm going to work in all the markets. I'll sign the the network contract, which is the New York contract. So I'll be signed. I'll be signed. It'll be management, and New York law will apply. Oh, okay. That 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 is interesting. I guess that presents some challenges and obstacles as well, which I know you've touched on. Are there any other ones that are challenges that are maybe hurting a model's prospects and anything in place to safeguard that besides what we've mentioned? Um, hurting model's prospects, there's the, the concept uh, of mother agency. So um, if, if a model is discovered uh, by uh, uh, an agency outside the United States or in a small town in Arkansas or uh, by some random person in an airport, as Kate Moss was found, um, that person and or the potential model's parent can be what's called the mother agent. And the, the, the mother agent, to, in, in many cases, doesn't book the model, but will place the model with other with other agencies, with agencies. And um, if, uh, for doing that, the mother agent will s split the commission with the placement agency. Oh, that's and nice. So sometimes that can be a disincentive to signing a model if you know you're only going to get, uh, you know, max 10% commission. Um, but mother agency, it's, it's, it's very prevalent. It's, it's just the, the way of doing things. Actually, the call I have after this is is about a, a young woman who after a long 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 time left a mother agency based in the south um, wants to leave and the mother agent is um, uh, being very tenacious about, about holding on and so the thing about models if a model signs a contract and and he or she is under the age of 18 even if the model's parent or guardian has signed the contract, the model can repudiate uh, for a short time after he or she reaches the age of maturity, um, which by short time, it's days. Oh, that's not a uh, long time at all. Um, you know, maybe a week, but it's it's a very, very, very short time. And um, and so once they reach the age of, of 21, it's a, it's a valid and binding contract. The agency can't compel the model to stay, but can sue the model for breach um, and, and get damages, not get an injunction, but, but, but get damages. So you see, it's a, it's a famously fluid industry, uh, models leaving, uh, moving about, agents leaving. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's it's as yeah that's it fluid very 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 fluid and there's there are certain protocols um, that most agencies because agencies will find themselves on both sides of this issue all the time models coming and going um, so if if a model leaves to go to another agency typically the second agency will split commission with the first agency for some period of time, the duration of the model's contract or for a year or for some period of time. But sometimes they, you know, dig in, sue, uh, sue for uh, tortious interference, which is not, not an easy case to prove. There are very high standards for, it's a high bar for showing tortious interference. And in modeling, the standard basically is but for, but for the interference of the second agency, the model would not have left the first agency. And, and, and it's, it, it's, it's t well, you know, sometimes there is solicitation, but many times it's a model being dissatisfied, unhappy, things aren't going so well, grass is always greener, looking for a, a, a new opportunity. So moving to, to another place. Of course, with hearing that they're like tied into their contracts with such a small window and frame to get out, especially with these mother agents, it's hard to imagine what other advocacy routes are in place for them to be able to fight for their needs and wants. What, what can they do? What's available for them besides having to breach their contract, if anything? 
Well, um, you know, if a model isn't working, uh, if a model isn't working and, and it's not due to... Sometimes an agency will let them will let a model go or just drop a model if the model's not working. But sometimes, uh, uh, and, and, and when models sign contracts, um, it's, it's this uh, interesting story. So I, I get, when I was still working with the Model Alliance, I gave a talk to a group of models who, who uh, um, and Coco, Rocho was there. So we had a nice big turnout. Aww. And uh, so, and, and they were working models. So I asked, how many of you are assigned to to contracts and uh, like a hundred percent raised their hand? Um, how many of you read your contracts? No one. How many of you have copies of your contracts, and and none. You know none. And and uh, when you're at an working in an agency or with an agency, when a model asks for a copy of her contract, you know she wants to go. I mean, you, you, you know that's what's happening because otherwise, and very few, very few models are in the position, have any leverage. There are so few real successful models. It's tough. It's a tough business. And, you know, everybody, you, you described it as glamorous and glittery. It's, it's not. It it's, really doesn't seem it's, that way. It's very, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a difficult and challenging, in many ways, dehumanizing business. And... Um, and in terms of what options a model has if she doesn't want to stay, well, you know, you talk to your agent and, and you hope that the agency you go to will work out a deal with your, your first agency. Um, again, they can't hold you to it. Are they going to sue you? It depends. It depends. If you're a big money maker for them, they're going to want to keep you. They're going to want to keep you, even if you don't want to stay. And if they can't keep you, they're going to want to share in the upside of what they, if they, especially if they feel they've invested in, in, in your career. I mean, again, there are two sides to all of these stories, multiple sides to all of these stories. And um, the models, uh, for a while, I was working with a group called the Humans of Fashion Foundation, Hoff. But um, and and they were doing advocacy, um, and and they've disbanded. Um, I I I think uh, there are lawyers uh, other than myself who understand the issue uh, issues to lesser or greater degrees. Um, but it's I'd say know what you're getting into. It's most model management contracts are three years, and and they roll over. They have automatic renewal provisions, which are kind of traps. They really are. And when I'm negotiating for a model on behalf of a model, I I cross it out. I I try to get a shorter term. I try to uh, instead of will automatically renew, may be renewed okay. upon agreement, written agreement of the parties. I, I, I mean, read the contract, get somebody to read it for you. I, I know a lot of young women, young men don't have the economic wherewithal, uh, don't, uh, aren't, English speaking is, is not their primary mode of, of communication. Of um, I understand all of this. Uh, but again, there are, there, it, it there, there are there are ways to 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 get some to to even the the leverage uh, a little bit. Yeah, it, it's definitely nice you can go in there and explain it to them. And even changing things as renewing to might renew is a huge, uh, like positive outcome for the models who, if they sure. have that leeway, if they're not happy, they can leave. So that's it's great that you can be able to help explain that to them and advocate for them. Yeah, because the, the automatic renewal, the very standard automatic renewal provision is 90 days written notice, 90 days written notice, and by registered or certified mail. So many technicalities that if if, if an agency is going to be hard-nosed about it, you didn't give me 90 days notice, you didn't send it by registered or certified mail, um, and some do play hard hardball about these kinds of things again depending upon where the interests lie um but you know there there are the agencies and and i 
model management companies, I'll use it interchangeably. The ones I work for are extremely, extremely ethical and uh, responsible. It is a business and they're not big businesses. They're, um, they're mom and pop shops, uh, lemonade stands. Uh, uh, one of them in the US is a publicly traded company, Wilhelmina. Uh, some of them are owned these days by hedge funds or other investors, but there are still a few family owned businesses um, and, and they're, they're little, they're not robust money mills. Um, so I, and I, I think uh, uh, tarring the entire modeling agency business is, is a mistake. I, I, I think some of the, uh, the schools, some of the, you know, it, it's kind of a scam if you have to pay a boatload of money to have your pictures taken right. to to sign up. If you have to give them two thousand, three thousand to be signed, right. that's you so know giving an arm and a leg just for what? Yeah, bills should should be going off, warning signs. But there are there are start, startup costs to becoming a model. So. Some some pictures have to be taken. Sometimes there has to be some dental work or uh, um, you know uh, facials or new wardrobe or uh, and and uh, where's the model going to live if they don't if they don't have an apartment in New York and um, so sometimes the agencies do have to advance money and and uh, um, and the advances are, the agencies expect the models to pay back the agencies. And so, you know, there, there's some controversy, uh, issues have been raised about uh, uh, unscrupulous practices. Um, in California, again, one of the distinctions, California has uh, speedy payment uh, rules for employees and models aren't employees, they're independent contractors. Um, but uh, for purposes of California law, they're treated as employees and have to be paid their wages upon discharge. And models get paid for two things. They get paid for um, the appear, you know, showing up, the photo shoot or the runway, and then they get paid for the usage of their image. And um, the usage payments aren't wages, but the day rates is payment. And if you're not paid immediately upon discharge, there are penalties of up to... 30 times what the initial uh, fee was. And there were very op opportunistic lawyers in California who made hay out of all of this um, and, and, and several cases. And, and, but New York doesn't, doesn't have um, those timely payment rules. And typically how models get paid and for all the, every agency I've ever worked with is, has been this way. The client pays the agency doesn't pay the talent, um, which is different than entertainment talent because some in, in most entertainment, in the entertainment world, the talent gets paid and then pays their agent and their manager. Mm -hmm. But here, the model management company gets paid, keeps its service fee, keeps its 20%, uh, you know, deposits the check. And then when the check clears in the next check writing cycle, which is usually five, 10 days after they receive payment, they pay the model. So it's not immediate, but it's, it's timely. Okay. Uh, but they don't pay the model. They don't pay the model if they don't get paid. And because they're not a bank. And, uh, you know, they can advance money that they expect to be repaid for. But uh, in, in the Fashion Workers Act, the bill that is, is, has been proposed now for uh, two years um, in the New York State Legislature, uh, one of the provisions which I've been talking to the bill sponsors about is timely payment. And uh, it, 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 important to recognize that New York is not California and that there, the, the burden should be on the clients. Uh, clients now pay 30 days, 30 days is a blessing. They pay 60 days, 90 days, 120 days. Sometimes they don't pay at all. Mm -hmm. And to expect the agencies to advance is, is, is not, is not really fair and equitable. It's not, it's not fair for an agency to keep money. That is the models, even if they have a dispute with the model, even if the model has left, terminated, 
breached, whatever, it's not the agency's money. They cannot, should not hold on to it. Must pay the model when they receive payment. And I, I'm very firm about that with, with when I talk to agencies I don't represent. Um, but yeah, I've wandered around a little bit. <laughs> that's, that's okay. That's nice. It's all good stuff. I know you're talking about more of the future and the legislation components. This could be kind of our last topic as we wrap up, but does that incorporate any of the right of publicity on the legal front, which is very apparent in the modeling industry? Um, if you could share more about how this right is, the models and primary intellectual property right and any challenges that come with, and then we can kind of wrap it up. Okay, perfect. Um, so the right of publicity is is not there is no federal right of publicity. Um, it's a it's a state by state by state patchwork. Every state has different rules. Some states have statutes. Some case some states have common law um, uh, rules. Uh, state like California has both uh, common law and statutory right of publicity. In it is the model's right to control the commercialization of his or her name, likeness, persona. Um, and, um, you know, persona can be voice, persona can be, uh, uh, Vanna, there's a famous case that the, somebody the had a, a room with Vanna White, uh, which moving and turning tiles, but right to commercially exploit his or her name or likeness. So, um, and there's a, the, the way there isn't copyright, uh, there is a, a fair use defense, but it's, it's commercialization. So when, when, when an uh, agency signs a release on behalf of a model, uh, the release is the document that controls the usage, the rules of the road. So the term, how long they can use it, in what media they can use it, for what purposes they can use it. Um, so it's, that is the authorized use. If the usage falls outside the term, the territory, the means, manner, and media, that's unauthorized usage in violation of the right of publicity. So that's when we can write a nasty gram, write a cease and desist letter, or try to get the the client to uh, to take down the image that's up on the billboard to uh the the release is sometimes built in uh language that says in 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 under no circumstances will you be able to enjoin the use and i like to put authorized use yeah. sometimes that gets stricken uh but basically the client wants to know that uh, they can use it and the model's remedy will will be damages um the right of publicity famously in new york um was for years and years was not descendable, which meant that it died with you, but those that law has been changed. So it lives on. So nice. your state can now control um, the dissemination, the commercial dissemination of, of your name, likeness and, and persona. Um, and that is the, the model uh, only has a copyright if the model actually takes the photograph of his or herself, so selfies. For example, um, gives the model expanded expanded rights. Uh, copyright is protected um, by federal statute, more robust protection. Uh, so some of the influencers who are actually acting as their own photographers or have uh, work for hire deals with the photographers who were taking uh, um, photos of them, videos of them, will also have the copyright in the material. Wow. But um, the clients like all of that typically to be assigned to them. Got it. So, that that yeah. definitely makes sense. It's If they could take their own and have their own copyright and more protections, why wouldn't they do that? I feel like that's becoming more prevalent now as we look into the future. I wish we had time to discuss more of social media and the social implications of the future, but we should save that for a later date. It could be its own separate podcast, which is super exciting because I know there's so much material there as well. Um, everything you said was super amazing to hear. I learned from Professor Scafidi. It was so nice that she was able to con connect us both. I really appreciate your time, all your wisdom and your stories. It was lovely to hear it all, even with the horrifying things that come within the model industry, because you're right, it's not all the glitz and glam as it's portrayed as on TV or social media even. 
So it's really cool to dive behind the scenes and get the real raw look of it all. So. Well, thank you, Rebecca. It's been a pleasure, and uh, I, I look forward to part two. Thank you so much. All right. Well, have a great rest of your day.